What is up, everybody? I'm ready. I'm back. Finished up my first semester of grad school. Check out my previous video. Ready to make some vids. I got a lot of stuff coming up, so let's get right into it. This is going to be a shorter vid, hopefully about like eight to 10-ish minutes, and we're going to be talking about Proclus. Proclus, Proclus, however you want to say it. He was a Platonic thinker in around the year 400, student of Plotinus, and he wrote a lot of really, really good stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through his first proposition in his Elements of Theology. It's a seemingly simple argument, but there's a lot of nuance to it. Uh, if you want to, you can go and download PDFs of the Elements of Theology. They're available for free online. Ancient texts, you can go buy the book. I have my copy sitting behind the camera. And I've got the argument stuff mapped out. But let's get let's get right into this here. So proposition one. Proclus, he writes like Spinoza. He writes like Euclid in propositional format. So really what I want to do here is I want to look at this proposition and kind of break down the argument. The idea or the title of it is that every multiplicity participates in unity. So right here, let's see, we have a candle. <clears throat> and so this is a multiplicity. We have the uh, candle and we have the top. We have the wax, the wick here. And so this is a multiplicity. But it's participating, Proclus claims, in a unity, and that unity is, in fact, a candle. See this all the time. We've got the whiteboard behind me. We've got the chair. The chair's a good example because it's got the legs. It's got the padding and everything. So all these multiplicities are participating in a unity. <clears throat> but why is this? Let's, let's kind of break this down here. Um, again, I'm going to link the, uh, I'm gonna link my notes in the video description below. So if you want to see me kind of spell out the argument in more detail. So here's my example that I wrote down yesterday. I said, uh, and you can use the candle, whatever. I say the pencil. The pencil, it's a distinct ontological unit. I see it and I see that it has parts, such as the eraser, the plastic tips, etc. So it seems that the pencil, the candle, whatever, they participate in unity as evidence, and this is the key starting point, as evidence by our sense experience. We see these distinct ontological units. They are one, they're singular, we can separate them off. You know, the candle is not the desk, is not me. So it's this distinct unit. <clears throat> but is this really the case? That's what we need to ask. Famously, you're gonna remember that Parmenides, Zeno, Heraclitus posited arguments that showed that the uh, reality we see is illusory. So maybe, maybe it's the case that the candle or the pencil or whatever seems like a unity, but it isn't, and the reality we live in is just an illusion. Let's, let's argue against that. Let's put forth this crazy good argument and show that everything participates in a unity. So here's Proclus's argument, okay? This is the way I mapped it out. <clears throat> and it's a, uh, it starts with an, an assumed premise. There are five premises after that, then a conclusion. So you can pause the video and write this down if you want after I say it. So the first thing is our assumption, our assumed premise is gonna be that there is no unity in things at all. This is what's called a reduction argument, a reductio ad absurdum. What we're doing is we're starting with the opposite of, or the negation of what we want to prove. We're going to derive a contradiction from that, and therefore we're going to, we will be justified in rejecting our first assumption and concluding what we do want to prove. If you don't know what I just said or have no idea what that means, just pause the video, go to Google, type in reductio ad absurdum, read a little bit about it. But the basic idea is we're starting with the opposite of what we want to prove. So we're assuming, first of all, that there is no unity of things, and we're seeing what follows from that. So after that, premise one, what follows? Well, no, no whole would be one. So if there is no unity in things at all, as we, we're assuming, then no whole, like the candle, would be one. So it would just be actually its parts, and candle would be shorthand for, you know, wood, glass, wick, wax, etc., etc. Now... What is crazy about this is that because of our assumption that there is no unity in things at all, we also have to say that the parts are not one. So the parts will actually be composed of their parts. They, they won't be a unified whole at all. So the candle is, because there's no unity, that's our assumption, the candle breaks down into its parts. Those parts break down into their parts, and the parts of their parts continue to break down. And this is going to go on into infinity. And each hole in our experience, each hole, computer, anything, because there is no unity at all, as we've assumed, each whole unit is breaking down into an infinite amount of parts. And those parts are breaking down into an infinite amount of their parts because there cannot be a unity, as we've assumed. So that means that really all of these objects around me, all the objects around you, are an infinity, infinitely multiplied. So, 
that's premise four there. So to restate this and catch you up a little bit, there is no unity in things at all. We've assumed away all unity, that's our assumption. No whole would be one, nor would its parts be one. This will continue to infinity and each whole or element will collapse into an infinite multiplicity. Everything will then be composed of infinities infinitely multiplied. Now here's the kicker, as Proclus states, this is impossible. Therefore, all things participate in unity. Okay, that's the argument. If you want, you can pause, you can go to his elements of theology. I think this is a faithful representation of the argument. Um, you can take my word for that, or you can go and reconstruct on your own. If you have any, if you disagree with my reconstruction, put it in the comments below, but I'm pretty sure this is logically valid. And so that means if we want to object to it, then we have to object to one of the premises. So let me take my look at my notes here. Um, and I have a informal presentation of the argument and the formal presentation in the notes, which you can go and look at below. So I put it in the premise conclusion format and I also put paragraphs of like kind of commentary on it. So um, let's see here. How can we object to this? Okay, so here's the, here's the kicker. Premise five is really the one that we can object to. And that's gonna be that it's impossible for everything to be composed of infinities infinitely multiplied. I think that all the others are, pretty much everybody's gonna accept them. So what we have to do is we have to provide evidence. We have to provide another argument for why it's the case that, we, that things cannot be composed of infinities infinitely multiplied. Why is that? Why is that the case? Well, I provide my own argument and Proclus provides his own. So I'm going to go through those and then we can, um, I'll briefly mention some objections and then we can call it a, call it a video. So, and then I'll wrap up at the end. <clears throat> so my argument here is that we cannot grasp infinities, yet we do clearly grasp holes, ontological units, and separate them off from other holes in reality. So, therefore, these holes cannot be infinite, infinities infinitely multiplied. I think this follows, um, again, it's mapped out in the uh, paper in the video description below in the Google Doc. But the basic idea is that if it were the case that these items around us, all around us, were composed of infinities infinitely multiplied under the assumption that there is no unity, then we wouldn't be able to grasp them because our minds can't grasp infinity. Yet we do clearly grasp them. Therefore, they're not composed of infinities infinitely multiplied. We, we see around us that objects are knowable, infinities aren't knowable, so therefore objects can't be made up of infinities. I think that, that that's an intuitive argument. Again, people can object. I have some objections listed that I'm not gonna get into here that I try to respond to. You can go and look, look at that below. But Proclus, his argument is even more interesting. So his argument is that the sum of things is greater than its parts. There is nothing greater than infinity. Therefore, infinities cannot sum up to create a thing as is needed to claim that holes are composed of infinities infinitely multiplied. So let me rephrase that. <clears throat> he starts by saying with the proposition that the sum of things is greater than its parts. Okay. There is nothing greater than infinity. So therefore, if we took infinities infinitely multiplied and composed them to make a unit or a, or a whole, well, we would have to get, based on that axiom that holes are greater than their parts, we would have to get something that's greater than an infinity, infinity infinitely multiplied. But that's impossible because there's nothing greater than an infinity. So Proclus then concludes that infinities can't sum up to create a thing. <clears throat> and so basically these two arguments that I just gave, my argument and Proclus's argument, are attempting to prove that it is impossible for things to be composed of infinities infinitely multiplied. And that's going to be supporting premise five of our original argument. And then what that's doing is that is demonstrating that all things participate in unity. <clears throat> so if this all sounded confusing, that's okay, because I have given you a main argument, <clears throat> which assumed that things don't participate in unity, derived the contradiction from that, that that's impossible. And in doing that, we had to defend premise five, 
and I gave two sub-arguments, my own and Proclus's argument for the defense of premise five. <clears throat> and so if you are still confused, take a look at the proposition and then take a look at what I've linked in the video description below. Now, <clears throat> I do have some objections here and I don't really wanna get into those because that will make the video extremely long. But all in all, I think that this argument's pretty good. I buy it. <clears throat> and um, I mean, it's very, very difficult and comes at a high cost to deny that these ontological units around us are not composed of, or, or, or do not participate in unity. There's a, I mean, you'd have to deny all your common sense. It would lead to the world around us just being infinities infinitely multiplied ad infinitum which would be contrary to what we can grasp. I mean, we can grasp these things as I argued. So therefore it seems that we, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm a little <clears throat> congested, but, but, but the basic idea is that this, this comes at a high cost if you wanna deny this. And I mean, think about it, try to, try to conceptualize how the argument works and try to see if you can come up with some of your own objections. But that's just a quick short video on the proposition First proposition, maybe I'll get into some more of these because I think there's a lot in Proclus's work. So I hope you enjoyed that.